Good afternoon together. Uh, nice to see you all back from the lunch break. Um, welcome to uh, our presentation on uh, enabling uh, the digital transformation from strategy to execution. My colleague Marcel and I, uh, Martin, uh, want to show you some ideas that we have developed at Scheffler um, to support the digital transformation of the company. So we start, uh, of course, with a short explanation. What is Scheffler? Some of you may know it, uh, most of you, maybe we can check who doesn't know Scheffler. I'm not from Germany. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some of you heard of it. Valid point. Most of you don't, that's okay. Um, we're an automotive supplier, somewhere between tier one, two and three, depends uh, how you look at it. So uh, we typically deliver components either to car manufacturers or to manufacturers of car manufacturer components. Um, so you typically will never, I guess, see a product directly in front of you with our name on it or notice actually that you use it. Um, still, um, it's, uh, it's one of the bigger automotive suppliers in Germany. It has some key facts, like you see some uh, almost 90,000 employees uh, currently globally. We're active uh, worldwide with uh, 71 plants, typically also close to the actual uh, customers. So we can supply the, the material in a short notice. Um, we have about uh, yeah, 2,400 patterns, that's important to us. We believe we're very innovative uh, in our field. Um, and this is, uh, for me, uh, as a new employee to Scheffler, only <coughs> not, not even a year now, this is still an impressive figure, 1.1 million tons of steel um, that we form every year. So this is kind of our core competency at Scheffler. We, we take raw steel and form it into something other. This is the main thing we do all day long. Um, so what comes out if we form this steel uh, after, after it leaves the plant? Um, so there is uh, three divisions that we, uh, that we believe uh, tackle the customer segments best, which is the automotive OEM part. So these are components that we deliver directly to uh, car manufacturers and they put it then in their cars. It's like uh, engine systems, it's a lot of bearings of course included because actually the bearing is the main thing that we do. So things rolling, reducing resistance, reducing friction. Um, it includes uh, transmission systems. And uh, then we are we're going more and more into, into other components like chassis systems uh, and uh, yeah, hybrid electrical drives uh, to see uh, what else we can do with our bearings. Um, then there is the automotive aftermarket. Main focus is basically uh, to provide spare parts for all the components that we delivered beforehand. And uh, finally, there's the industrial sector. That's a very different topic. Uh, much more diverse, much more different application scenarios. And then we see just some examples like wind turbines, uh, aerospace turbines, trains, and so on and so forth. So everything that's basically moving might have a part of Scheffler in because you want to reduce the friction if it's moving. This picture as well shows um, already one of our uh, challenges. You might think that um, having bearings in uh, automotive systems might be similar to having bearings in uh, aerospace. But for some of you that uh, potentially are from the field, uh, if you ask the engineers, this is a totally different ball game. Uh, there's a total different ball game from, from the environment that those uh, pieces are acting in. So on the one hand side, uh, when it comes to the aerospace, then of course it's extreme environment as well. The development cycle is something completely different. A couple of weeks ago, I was with our aerospace colleagues and uh, we were talking about innovation. And uh, we are, of course, we are talking about uh, digital transformation and transforming the company um, as such. And then we were a little bit surprised when we heard about the development cycle and innovation cycle when it comes to aerospace where some colleagues were talking about, okay, I'm now with uh, Scheffler 20 years, and we were talking about uh, predictive maintenance and uh, vibration sensors, stuff like that, that we have in the pipeline. And they said, yeah, potentially, when I retire, those innovations will hit the market. So we are talking sometimes about development times until things can be um, built uh, into aerospace uh, of 20 years. Uh, so this is the, the diversity, it sounds similar, but when it comes to the requirements, it might sometimes be quite, quite different. Well, um, so this is just a 
to, to set the story up, of course, uh, we do believe uh, in disruption. We do believe uh, actually disruption already happened, probably also for our field of, of industry. The question is just uh, basically when does it hit and how does it hit, how strong, uh, how far, whatever. So, um, yeah, we believe we need to take care of that. We need to think about it. We need to, to actively do something. And this is as well, a, it's a culture question. We will talk about that later on in the presentation, uh, probably a little bit more. Um, but when it comes to disruption, it is not always very visible. Of course, when you think about it, then you can come up with examples like when Apple came up with the iPhone, what happened to Nokia? That clearly was a disruption. Or the old example when you talk about development of MP3 technology, or Apple when it came up again with the iTunes store, what it did to the music industry. Um, so sometimes in our conversation with our stakeholders in Scheffler, and uh, potentially you might recognize that from, from your stakeholders sometimes as well, when you come up again and again with these used and prominent cases, you get somehow the, yeah, yeah, but that's not us. Uh, and yes, we, we recognize we are in a, in a different field, so there are different, different areas um, where disruption and innovation has a different pace. There's retail, where we have Amazon and Alibaba, who somehow drives everyone that they need to catch up. There's the music industry, there's everything with electronics. What could it be in our field? Because disruption does not necessarily mean that someone comes up with a, with a product that completely replaces the product that you bring to the market. If you look into MP3s, there it was more the channel, so the way how music was provided. And this is, as, uh, well, the same, the same for us. As soon as someone comes up, for example, with smarter ways to provide the products, to connect in a faster way to our customers, then potentially our business is drifting away. So flexibility right now in our industry is super, super important. Our users or our customers are in the automotive industry and right now you know about uh, e-mobility. So they don't really know what is happening next and when something will hit the market. So they actually don't want to fix the contracts um, for years with us and want to have more flexibility. So for us, for example, one of the, the areas of uh, disruption where the race is on is how flexible could we be? Uh, one example is that we look a lot into forecasting. On the other hand side, and forecasting as well, this is very connected to digital and data at the heart. So our CE uh, level is very much behind, can you give us the 100% forecasting? Can you give it fast? And then we say, yeah, 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 sure, we can. You can have it tomorrow 100% precise, and then we forecast that in three, four, five months, the market will, down, will go down for 30%, and then? And then they give you the evil eye and actually say, yeah, what do you mean? So what is the measurement in the company that you actually apply when such a forecast would come? That is then our question. And then they start to think and we try to support them in saying, okay, potentially there's something else in addition Forecasting is not bad, it's good to have a good forecast, but potentially there's something different that we should do as well and look into as well. Right, so as well as we believe disruption already happened or it will happen at some point in time, so it's not a question if, but just when, um, it's not common sense. Even within our company, I would say, it's not common sense. Still, uh, we achieve to, to get some vision, some strategy for the future. So uh, we do believe in change at least. So there are two main components, e-mobility, something we believe in, and Industry 4.0 is something we believe in. Both major changes for our company and for the business we do. And we see the, the whole topic of digitalization on the a, on a left-hand side now more as an, as an enabler. It's about connectivity, it's about machines, analysis, and uh, basically a data-driven business. And, uh, on the next slide, I think we can have a bit of a more deeper look into what does it actually mean for us when we talk about digital. So um, a few years ago, we started to define a digital agenda, um, which was a big topic driven by our CTO back then. And uh, this digital agenda basically contained four major fields, which is products and services. So actually looking at the products that we offer to the market, how can we digitalize them? What does it mean to digitalize them? And basically the goal was to talk about censoring. So can we take a bearing and make it a sensor? 
because actually everything that's moving in this system, whatever it is, car, train, uh, industrial machine, has bearings inside. And if you can sensorize these bearings, actually you have the whole machine more or less sensorized. You know everything about temperature, uh, friction, and so on. So this was, was one of the components we were looking in. Then uh, more the machines and processes view is an inside view. How can we enhance our efficiency in our production processes? If you remember, we have 1.1 million tons of steel that we somehow manufacture, so that's a lot of operation, a lot of manufacturing in. How can we make this considerably more efficient? Um, the third component was to, to, to focus and, and to say data. Uh, that's the new thing, that's one of the key things that changes. We, we not only produce more data, but we are able to also link this data and to process more of this data and create new insights and use it not only for analysis, but maybe also for simulation, again, saving a lot of effort or creating new insights. And then we talked about uh, the fourth component, which is the user experience and the customer value, um, asking ourselves, what can we do with the data also for our customers? How can we use it? Can we do things like, uh, I mean, everybody tries to do that, but things like predictive maintenance, uh, can we use the data? to enhance the life cycle of the products, to figure out where our products might fail too early, and so on and so forth. So, At the same time, of course, if this is customer facing, this is about new products, new services, enhancing our current um, product portfolio, finding new revenue streams. We, at the same time, try to do, of course, internal efficiency gains by applying everything that comes under the umbrella of digital and quite often, at least in our company, this is the case, digital is then as well quite often mixed up with agile. Yeah. So, and then the, the business does not exactly know what we are currently talking about and depending on whom you talk to, they have different understandings of what it actually is. So as you can see, this is the, these are the things that we would like to bring to the market. So depending on whom you meet, people might understand, okay, yeah, digitalization, you talk about sensors. Then you meet someone else, digitalization, yeah, yeah, you talk about applying advanced robotics within our production lines and connecting our own machines. So it's a fog of digitalization, and we as enterprise architects are luckily uh, involved in that and uh, can, in a humble way, use our touch points with our speaking partners to more and more clarify what it means for them, what it could mean for the entire company. And the important word here is uh, in a humble way. Uh, we were, um, with the digitalization, we started four or five years ago. Um, in a way, like many companies start building up a small team first to look into it, and then we, we, we grew the team. So meanwhile, we are 80 people. And from 1st of January, we will merge this expert team with the, with the wider, wider community with, uh, in Scheffler. So we are scaling out. And we have this uh, luxury situation that we were able to look into many different things that are ongoing in the company, and that we talk to the experts uh, as well that we have in the team when it comes to data scientists, data architects, etc., etc. So what we will as well come to in this presentation is that we as architects, as enterprise architects, are enlarging a bit our responsibility and become the change ambassadors in a humble way as well to our management levels uh, to really bring some, some uh, structure into all these different things that could be understood under the foggy word digitalization. Right, and that's uh, something we, we started to try, for example, with this slide. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty much a kind of word play, maybe, to a certain extent, but still, there is different perceptions. What is digital? We see it a lot in our business, with our business uh, partners, uh, basically, a year ago, I would say, if we talked to HR, for them, digitalization was implementing <coughs> HR success factors. Um, but that's not what we would believe as a digital transformation. So, so this scale is quite, quite nice to explain it sometimes. Success factors is here. It's okay. Maybe you start to, to talk here. But what we see now, for example, after some time of working with HR, to stay with that example, now they start to dig into ideas of people analytics. What would it mean? What is it actually? It's a nice word. Sounds great. What is it? What can we do with it? And how could we do that? 
So we're trying to move the discussion up here more to this side to actually get to what we think is transformative because uh, that's where the disruption actually will happen. So this is the goal in what we do to bring people, to enable people to, to have a look outside of this thing because actually if you talk to an IT department, I mean this is what we do since 15 years, or 50 years, sorry. This is uh, basically home turf of IT. We digitize processes. But now with the transformation, we think we need to do something different. And this different is not that easy to shape. This as well is uh, where we come in as uh, with the business architecture discipline and as well touching those areas that the business really believes belongs to them. And we bring some additional wording, um, some additional structure into the picture. So one of the things that we are currently uh, working on is uh, to bring in the concept of business model innovation and having actually different business models and uh, different uh, operating models in one and the same company. We are very much driven as a manufacturing company, so to say, forming, forming steel for efficiency. Uh, so we have a lot of en engineers and um, to utilize, for example, that's, that's two, two elements that might we uh, come later to, to um, as well. One is that in our values, we have a zero failure value, top value, zero value, uh, zero uh, error value, um, zero value, that would be not so, not so nice. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is um, that we want to utilize our capacity uh, always to 100%. A machine works then well when you, when you really use it to 100%. So to bring in new values that are then more applicable in uh, new, let's say, operating models, where you need to have more agility, more slack in the system, so you are not utilizing, for example, your creative people to 100%. Uh, um, and as well, you say, yeah, but we should dare to make mistakes, we should experiment, you need to explain what you mean, because people that for, for centuries uh, were grown up with this uh, zero mistake mentality and uh, utilizing our full capacity, they might not really understand what you mean and they as well in the beginning might not agree. So there's a lot of communication necessary. Right, so why is this important? I mean, this is a nice picture, I think, to, to just explain it. We're coming basically from a world like this, an engineering world. You have a complex system. If you basically look long enough at the system and watch all the sprockets and things moving along, you actually can understand it. If you apply logic to this system, you can figure out how it works. And you can solve what happens if you turn this wheel. But if we go more into this world of digital transformation, we believe it is not solvable by pure logic, but it gets more complicated. The question, what happens when I pull this blue wire cannot be solved by applying logic. It doesn't matter how much engineers you put onto the topic, how long you analyze it, how long you look at it, you will not solve the question. You can only solve this question. What happens when I pull this blue wire? You can only solve it by try. You need to try it and you need to accept that the outcome might not be perfect. It might even not even, it might be no outcome at all. Maybe it just Nothing happens, I don't know. Could be. But this is what you said, zero fault, operational effectivity, capacity usage. That's not the goal that you can apply here. It's different measures you need. And uh, it also ties perfectly back to the keynote we heard yesterday. Creativity is not coming when you're running under full steam. That doesn't work. Another story that we often tell when it comes to this uh, test and learn approach is uh, something like that. Who of you has kids? Okay. Who of you can ride a bike? Okay. Who of you was successful by teaching your kids in riding a bike by explaining to it and analyzing how you actually do it? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think test and learn there applies much, much more to that type of things as analyzing for a long time and then figuring out how it works and uh, applying it. I mean, of course, there are robots that meanwhile can ride a bike, and it was done by analyzing to a certain, uh, a certain extent, but even there, you apply machine learning and uh, neural networks, so stuff, it's not, it's not an engineer sitting there in a room for hours to figuring it out, right? Now, I was looking into evidence. How is it uh, working with the digital transformation in Germany? And I came across this one survey which kind of shocked me if you look at the figures. Uh, the question was to some 200 C-level uh, uh, managers in, in German companies. And the question was basically, how do you rate the impact of the digital transformation in these areas like revenue models, target markets, culture and organization, and so on? And if you look at these figures, actually here, these, these four, 75% of these C-level managers actually answered that there is a rather low or even no impact at all from digitalization on revenue models, target markets, product portfolio, customer segments. What? Really? <laughs> I mean, I'm not a C-level manager, but I'm pretty sure this is not true because any disruption we saw in the last couple of years actually involved all these elements. And even up here, cultural sales, production processes, 50% roundabout, don't see any big impact from digitalization. I mean, this is 2016, to be fair, three years ago. Maybe things changed a little bit. But still, very often, when you talk to the business about digital transformation, you can feel this is still valid. This is still there. So about 50% don't think there is a big impact from digital transformation on what they actually do. At the same time, we do think that the disruption already happened. It's just a question when it will hit our organization. And at the same time, we see everybody wants to do something digital because you need to do digital nowadays. You have to have it on your agenda somewhere because if you don't do digital, you're, oh, you're old school. It's boring. So everybody is doing something. We see a lot of activity, robot process automation, industry for, for zero, of course. There is uh, performance marketing, customer driven something, whatever. So everybody is doing digital, everybody. Because you cannot afford to say, no, I don't do digital. But at the same time, people don't believe that it has an actual impact on what they achieve. So is it a game? What we play? Is it theater? What's happening there? That's, that's an area where we as, uh, as architects in uh, talking to our stakeholders as well play a vital role in, in our company um, to actually shed some light on what people believe and bring in uh, evidence from the outside, but then as well evidence from, from the inside. And uh, it is often so that in a business where you have a product and the product cannot really be done in a digital way, like bearings, so something that, that moves for quite a long time, the bearing will be there. Yeah? So it is more or less in your business model something else that is disrupted or not necessarily the product immediately. So it is very difficult to convince people. Uh, the aerospace people, for example, I was talking to, uh, to a top-level uh, sales guy in, in aerospace and uh, he really told me, yeah, but this is all not, not relevant for us. Yeah? As long as there will be airplanes in the air, they will need bearings and uh, takes development takes anyhow 15, 20 years, so it's not applicable for us. And that is where we get into the picture and really bring evidence from our own business, from competitors, from the outside to, to convince uh, people that it is relevant. Yeah. Second thing is that on the other hand side, digital is on vogue. So as Martin already said, everyone now in Scheffler, when business goes down, wants to do something with digital. But it is exactly that. It is something. Yeah. And um, what we do is we are building up an enterprise portfolio so that we really get inside and as well see where the dependencies, where the logical um, sequence is, and as well where the focus should be. So is it really so that we should actually invest in HR analytics right now? Or is it so that we should invest in the best forecasting tool for Scheffler? Or is it something else? This is where we're really um, supporting the business. I'm looking at the time a little bit, so I think it's, uh, it's time now to come to the actually core message. What do we want to achieve? Why do we think it's important? 
Um, I think as an enterprise architect, typically, this is our core domain. We want to enable the business to take smart decisions. Therefore, we do all the, thing, all the things we do. But to, to make our business able to succeed in the digital transformation, which is vital as far as we think, we need to extend what we do even and step out of this core competency that we saw for us as enterprise architects. So we need to somehow work on increasing the digital competence of our business leaders. They need to understand what digital means. And with this, we can enhance the transformation ability of the company to actually enable, unlock these patterns and systems that so far avoid the transformation. So this is definitely to include, um, like you already mentioned, a humble way of educating. I mean, we cannot go there as an enterprise architect and in front of the board and tell them, so you don't understand nothing about digitalization, I'll tell you. That's probably not going to work. So we need to figure out ways. How do you talk to the business? How can you actually educate them in a way that they're willing to accept this? Yeah. And then, of course, um, even if you understand it, even if you start to believe it, there is still the culture thing. We talked about culture quite a bit, I guess. In the end, um, to achieve in these three steps, we actually need to work on culture. So one thing that we, that we do from uh, an enterprise architecture, we use every single touch point that we have. And uh, as many speakers before already said, these are um, the, the major projects that are running um, to, first of all, offer value. Uh, and we, we have a methodology, we call it uh, three times three. So for, and it sounds very, um, I would say, simple. So get invited, impress, and deliver value. Actually, you can already start with the first thing, get invited, and think uh, quite a lot about that. How do you actually do that? How do you get the, the major managers, decision makers, to actually include you in the loop. One way is to uh, apply governance. You basically say uh, you have to if it really comes top down, if that is possible in your company. Uh, we were in a conference in, in Berlin, and what we figured out at the end is that there is a, there's a pattern. So if you are already one step into the grave, uh, so you are a little bit desperate, that it is more likely that you apply a governance approach and basically force everyone to use enterprise architecture to bring some structure to your mess. If you are still in a, in a situation where you are in a linear growth model, like Scheffler was with the automotive industry over the last 10 years, so we were just growing every year because the automotive industry was growing, or my former employer, IKEA, was just growing over decades by opening new stores until people started to order some furniture online. And for us now, it is that actually e-mobility, diesel gate, and uh, the trade war is hitting, so it does not work anymore. Still, Scheffler is in this luxury situation that quite many things work quite well which as well is connected to the fact that we have not only the automotive, but the aftermarket and the industry. So we are still in this phase where we have to convince and need to get some buy-in. So getting invited is the first step. And then impress. How do you impress? You impress normally by having some data, having some insight from either inside the company or coming with good examples from outside the company. And then at the end, you need to deliver to your stakeholders some value. Uh, as Nancy said yesterday in, in, in her speech, in, um, that you need to find allies and need to really ask them what is it that you need. Yeah? So to come there with our enterprise architecture mythologies and say, okay, let's talk about business capability, and they actually look at you and ask you, what for, yeah? doesn't really help. So find out what it is that they actually need and then really be smart to deliver that value to them. What we do then, the second three, is doing that by facts. That is very much, for, for our stakeholders, important. But as well, build up trust. And then there is something new, the emotional <coughs> part and the empathy. Uh, so only if you bring it across, as we already said, in our situation right now, in a humble way. If you step in and you say, 
I'm here to support you. I'm with you in the same boat. We all want the best for the company. That builds trust. If you come in and say, okay, we now need to do here some architecture because of this is all a mess, it looks uh, potentially a little bit different. Last but not least, um, we are applying customer-centric material very, very much. So it needs to be simple, concise, and actually clear for the receiver of that information. So every complicated stuff for our senior management, we, we take it out and really tailor the message to their needs. Still, we are very persistent on using every touch point to repeat our story. Now, uh, some more into detail. What does it look like? So we're not just running around drinking coffee with the business stakeholders. Uh, we also apply a framework that we developed over time. Um, an important point here is we do not apply the framework from here to here. So it's not that we meet you in the business uh, meeting and tell you, okay, let's start here. First, we need to fill out a business motivation model and then we can move on. But we try to, to, to get to the business at the very point where they are. If they already done something like this, even if it's a very different methodology they used, oh, we can start here, it's no problem. Because we're here to support the business, not to teach them a method that we think is great. But these are tools that we put in, it's a bit like a big box of tools that we carry with us, and if somebody needs a tool out of it, we help them to apply it. And we have structured the process basically from the very early part of creating a mission, defining a vision, all the way to the, through the strategy project uh, process into the project portfolio. What actually needs to happen? What projects do I need to execute to achieve my goals? And over the time, we see basically a development from kind of an intended architecture. What do I want to do into an emerging design? What actually really is implemented then on the go? And uh, maybe to give you just a bit of a better idea what, what this could mean, we have a few examples. So this is, um, even in a digital world, when it comes to workshopping with business stakeholders, then uh, we fall back to the uh, nice old sticky notes. Yeah? But then you can see that this is really applied to, to the actual uh, business areas. So here was the, was the airplane at the top that was a workshop done with uh, the aerospace guys. On the left-hand side, you can see some work that we did with uh, our controlling people. Um, and then what we always do is uh, we apply something that is coming from uh, Professor Kim, who wrote uh, stuff about the Blue Ocean strategy. We double check what is actually ongoing in our business against what a customer or value receiver actually really wants. So what you can see here, for those that don't know the happy line from Mr. Kim, is that this is the relevance of certain things rated according to the customer or receiver. So is it really important for the receiver? And the top three are normally those things that really make a difference for the customer and the receiver. Then our business people, they have to rate where they currently are as well against the market. And then we map our initiatives that are already in flight or that are planned against those customer perspectives. Because what we found out is that, that constantly people are doing, let's say, continuous improvement stuff, yeah, but don't necessarily really hit the nails that are really make a big difference. And this is a very simple exercise that you can do early on with your business stakeholders, which visualizes it. And then some aha moments normally happen. Yeah. So for example, as you can see here, there was a business area that invested a lot in a certain area where they already were above average, above what is expected. Uh, and then there is another area which was the most important part for the customer. And as you can see, only one initiative was addressing the most important part. Uh. Right, this is an example out of the operations area. Uh, here we drove it even further exactly with this question, are we investing in the right topics? So what we did here over, I think, a de uh, was a period of over one year, there was first a build-up of business capabilities for this specific area, building the factory for tomorrow. So we defined business capabilities, we started to 
assess and score these business capabilities, like with business relevance? Are they strategic or are they unique differentiating or are they something like commodity? Something we also saw yesterday by PwC. We also rated these business capabilities then with something we call the uh, digital maturity. So in a, it's a bit like a CMMI model we applied there, similar to CMMI. So how far is this maturity already? Is it a totally manual process or is it already a fully automated autonomous process basically and all the steps in between? And, and then it was also applied the to be view, not only the as is view. And out of this exercise, then they came a kind of a top-down strategic view. What are actually important capabilities that we need to invest in? And this was then mapped against the project portfolio in the area of the Factory for Tomorrow program. And the outcome was very different from what was developed in a bottom-up continuous improvement approach. And with these two views now, they are able to actually build a balanced portfolio to drive the operations area forward. Next example. Um, this is a little bit more technical. It shows um, a layered architecture on the left-hand side um, and components. This is, let's say, high-level communication material to um, top management to help them decide if they should invest in something custom built or if there is uh, a standard software. Yeah? Don't know how it is with your companies. Um, we, are, we are a big SAP user and uh, have to migrate to S4 HANA. And of course, quite often when we meet our stakeholders, they actually put the question, yeah, but isn't S4 HANA doing this? Uh, so this is one way um, to, to explain uh, where your system actually is. So it's uh, another view of pace layering, right? And at the top, what you can see is differentiating material, things that very often changes, where you potentially should invest either in best of breed solutions or even custom build, where you will either not find something in a big uh, standard software, uh, or it doesn't really make sense for you at this, uh, at this moment in time. Uh, so what you can see down here, it's more from a trend perspective, more standard. And if you go up there, uh, you should potentially um, invest in having those capabilities and knowledge in-house and even develop in-house and not apply a software, uh, a standard software there. Um, again, this is as well a slide that is then used and where you can map and say, in these areas, we should apply an operating model where you go fully agile or even skate agile. And in another area where it is more standardized, um, you buy a standard software and you can actually very well stay with your old procedures. Fits there quite, quite well. My famous, uh, or my, my uh, example there is if you roll out a standard payroll system, just into the next country, you potentially don't need a full agile setup with UX designers, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't really make sense. All right, and then the final example. Um, one of our core deliverables as a business architecture team is uh, a capability framework with stable business capabilities. But, and that's the more important piece of it on the other side, you see also um, more details to these business capabilities. So we don't do, do have, of course, a kind of a description documentation, which is agreed with the business in the end. But we also have, for example, here, descriptions about what do we think is the next iteration if we progress this, if we advance this. How do we perceive, just on a textual level, what's the future state of this business capability? And how would we define the gap? What's, ex what's actually between us now and the future state we want to achieve. And here, we are able then to put these two major scorings, for example, in like we have a business relevance, we have four quadrants, yesterday we saw three. Um, I think we started actually also out with, with three two years ago, but now it's four. It looks nicer because you can make a matrix out of it. And uh, we have the digital maturity assessment, also in, a, in an SS and to B state. So how far is this process already, or this, this capability, sorry, already digitalized in, 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 in its abilities of using um, technology, starting from a really uh, unconnected state of manual work up onto a fully autonomous operation. We're using that to steer the focus of the company. 
So for example, where you should invest. Uh, to, to really show what this capability is, is this differentiating for you or not? And uh, where actually do you put right now your money? So easy heat maps uh, already tell a lot. If you put your money a lot into uh, capabilities which are non-differentiating, then potentially there's something wrong. Okay, and we want to close with a nice quote from Edgine, uh, reminding us that uh, the topic is quite complex and nobody can solve it on his own, but I leave it to you to just read it. And uh, thank you very much for your attendance. And There's probably room for one question. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> we take, yeah, yeah, we take that question. Can you, can you uh, give an example of this uh, new revenue streams and new business model? Sure. Sure. Uh, sensors. We have, uh, we have sensors. We are experts when it comes to vibrations. Um, and normally what we did in the past is uh, we sold the sensor, but then when it comes to interpreting the data, it was an expert that was sent over, really a field uh, co-worker who looked at it, who looked at the machine, uh, and then was actually giving some uh, advice. And meanwhile, we have a digital hub with uh, some services in it that you then can subscribe to, um, and with an app that actually where we codified that knowledge into the app. So when we get the raw data, we interpret that raw data and actually say what actually is happening with your machine. Think about um, a production line where our bearings are in and you use our sensors. We can pretty, pretty good foresee what is uh, going on with that machine. So you can avoid a standstill of your production line or think about wind miles. Uh, and that is what we are offering now as a service. Uh, companies can subscribe to it and it's a new revenue stream. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.